Shalom to you, it's a thrill to be here. Wayne, Anne, all of you, seeing some old friends around, some new friends. I am really thrilled, principally because, truth be known, I'm really not representing me. I stand as a representative of a cadre of Messianic Jews, a variety, a number, that have come together to produce a, a, a joint venture uh, version of the Bible. Uh, Dave Stern, if you're familiar with the complete Jewish Bible, uh, the, the Jewish New Testament, uh, told me when we had Shabbos dinner the other night, you know, when he uh, put in for this, it was hard to get anybody to work together to do anything, never mind to find a publisher. Uh, there was a woman, uh, Donya Greenberg, uh, and her husband, Rabbi Mark Greenberg, who conceived this, it's easy to stand up and, you know, the project manager and all the rest and to think that he's really the principal. What I'm going to do this evening is share from a dream that was birthed in the heart of a woman who thought, gee, what would the world look like if you can get a bunch of Messianic Jewish rabbis and scholars to work together. And let me tell you, that's a really ambitious request. You know, especially if you add doctorate on top, you know. The, you know, Yeshua, Jesus talked about shepherding as comparing it to, you know, shepherding leading sheep. But trying to lead scholars is like trying to lead cats. <laughs> You know, and everybody's got ideas, and you add Jewish scholars on top, a bunch of Ph. deities is what I call them. <laughs> you know, everybody's up there on Olympus and has ideas about the way the world ought to be, and uh, how on God's earth can uh, y y you get people to work together to do something? Well, let me tell you a little bit about... Uh, the industrial side of what's involved in fulfilling Donya's vision, and then I have the opportunity to open it up and, and share from it. On the industrial side, uh, Donya got a group, a board together that was made up of members of all the major uh, messianic umbrella organizations. We have our clusters. Uh, the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregation, the Messianic Jewish Alliance, this and that, and got a board together made up of everyone from them. And the board uh, developed key principles for uh, some foundational issues associated with the manufacture of a Bible that everyone could conceivably weigh in on, participate in, etc. Then came the task of finding translators. Dick Averbeck, a professor, the head of the PhD program at Trinity a University, uh, rolled out certain requirements that he thought would be appropriate for translators. The task was to fill these various slots. It's amazing the way individuals rolled up their sleeves to get to it. The Genesis text that I'm going to read from this morning was translated principally uh, by Seth Pastel, a brilliant Messianic Jewish scholar, PhD out of uh, Golden Gate Seminary in San Francisco, I believe, professor here at Israel College of the Bible, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, Hebrew scholar. The text that he translates is uh, then sent off to a text manager. Uh, that we don't work alone. A text manager is someone who works a particular section of the literature. The text manager for the Torah is a Messianic rabbi, uh, Jeffrey Adler. What happens is that this uh, translated text uh, is worked over and conversated over between uh, a Rabbi Adler and, and Dr. Pastel. Then it goes to a theology committee when the text manager is satisfied, he has a read that he can live with, that he wants to present. Then a theology committee that's made up of a variety of theologians. Uh, Ray Gannon is one of them. And by the way, Dr. Gannon is one of the best kitties in the Messianic Jewish litter. That's the God's honest truth. <laughs> Ray Gannon has had his hands and heart in everything. I could just spend 45 minutes talking about him. 
Uh, Dr. Gannon, a brilliant scholar, took a PhD here out of Hebrew University after uh, working his way to and through Princeton University for a graduate degree on Trump. A real lover of the Lord and the Jewish people. Well, Ray Gannon is on that committee, another Elliot Clayman. Uh, who took a degree from Harvard University. Elliot's a retired professor out of Ohio State, and he's a principal, a leader in what's called the Jewish Theological Institute. Rich Robinson's on the Theology Committee, took a PhD out of Westminster Seminary in the East Coast of the United States, working with the group Jews for Jesus. Uh, there are others as well. The point is, they all worked under Eric Tokajer, the chair of the Theology Committee. What happens is documents translated text goes to that committee, they work through it, they critically reflect on it, and then send it back to the uh, text manager with their uh, reflections. The text manager uh, works it out in accordance with that committee, and by the way, I didn't mention, in conversation with our literary editor, uh, Dr. Glenn Blank is a retired professor out of uh, Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. He's a Messianic rabbi, brilliant with the English language. He has his hands in the process all the while. Well, the text manager gets this document back after the, th the theos have worked on it and nuances it and then sends it off for another set of eyes, what we call our language expert. Uh, some time back, I made the acquaintance some years ago with a woman, uh, uh, and Helen Dallaire is, is not a Jewish woman. She is an evangelical Christian woman that just fell in love with the Lord and, and fell in love with the Lord's people, the Jewish people, fell in love with Israel. Uh, by way of Oral Roberts University, Helen felt called to go to Hebrew Union College and take a PhD in Semitic languages. If you don't know, Hebrew Union College is it's, it's the academic center of American modern Judaism, Reform Judaism. It's their training school. Helen went there, uh, a, a non-Jew went to this Jewish uh, religious school and got a PhD in, in, in the language. And she came and was in Israel and Hebrew Union College called her back and asked if she would join the faculty to teach Hebrew. A non-Jewish woman, an evangelical Christian woman teaching rabbis how to speak the language. <laughs> I think that's fascinating. Well, the Lord had Helen there for a number of years, and then she went on to Denver Seminary to head up a, uh, a Master of Divinity program in Messianic Jewish Studies. I asked Helen if she'd be our language expert, and what happens is as this literature, as this sacred text makes its way through the process, we want someone else with another set of eyes to alight upon it, critically reflect on it, and then kick it back to the text manager. So we have these various processes. I liken it to a, a car wash where the car goes in and it's hit by various brushes and washes and swabs and what have you, and then it's dried off and it comes out the other end. The purpose here was to present a Bible translation that restored the Jewishness of the text. And what we wanted was the Messianic Jewish community uh, that now is at a place where a number of individuals have been able to you know, respond to the call of God to go into the ministry, to go to seminary, to get the requisite language skills, and uh, now have the opportunity to then present together a, a common voice in what we want to say about the scriptures. This is particularly significant in the way that we render the new covenant, all too long, as you may well know, uh, the Bible story, the Jesus story, is construed so very much as non-Jewish. And it's tragic to me that the Jesus story is a Jewish story through and through, but with the passage of time and circumstance, people lost sight of the Jewish roots. And what happens is what becomes a Jewish story becomes un-Jewish and anti-Jewish, and gone is the memory. Well, the name of the game was to work the text collectively in a way that can help bring that out, not just with the text itself. One of the distinguishing characteristics is the artwork itself. We wanted to, uh, it was Danya's vision who has a real heart for art. She uh, wanted it, uh, she wanted a Bible that, uh, that a, you know, an eighth grader could comprehend in the way the language is spelled out and in the way that there's art to embellish to help people to envision, to retell the Bible story from a Jewish perspective. In any case, as I'd said, I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm not here 
um, uh, is an extension of my own vision, but rather my own participating in Donnie is to tell you the truth. And it's amazing how the Lord gives visions to people to do things. Donya wasn't raised in the Jewish world. She, she accepted the Lord and fell in love with the Jewish people and married a rabbi. She could say to herself, who am I to even conceive something as ambitious as this? Furthermore, she's not an academic. She's educated, took a bachelor's degree, but not, not in theology or ministry. She could disqualify herself in her own mind saying, not only am I not able by birth and generation to be able to even talk about something like this, I don't have the pedigree that anybody's gonna take me seriously. Dan Juster, who is in effect the Rambam, the Maimonides of our movement, uh, a sage told me at dinner a few nights ago, he said he remembered when uh, Danya came over and presented to Takun, and uh, they prayed over her, there was a spirit of prophecy. It was birthed by the Lord, not by power, not by might. So many times we disqualify ourselves thinking, well, I really can't do that. It's like the guy that sees the pretty girl and he wants to talk to her and he just gets spooked before he starts. Uh, or so many times uh, we just talk ourselves out. We're going to look in the Genesis text now, and there you find early on, early on, V'ruach Elohim Rechefet Hamayim, the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. Early on in Genesis, there's a story about, uh, about nothingness and choshech, darkness, what individuals refer to as uh, chaos and void. We're told, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And one encounters a God in the literature that just brings life out of nothingness that he creates. And truth be known, uh, Danya, uh, it would be easy for her to be talked out of the vision that was in her. Uh, but I liken her to um, inasmuch as Golda Meir managed to get all these Jewish generals together to fight a war instead of each other. Uh, in, in so many ways, it was Danya who, who conceived the vision, and the Lord just you know, caused a bunch of pushy guys like myself to get behind it. And uh, as I get up here and teach from the Tree of Life Bible, uh, for the first time opening up the Genesis text, uh, I want to give all credit to the Lord, but I don't want to steal anything uh, that's really due to somebody else as, as the primary visionary. And so the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. So I wanted to make very clear to all of you that though I'm represented as the manager, etc., it's the manager, it, it's participating in stewarding in a vision that was cast initially by somebody else. And I'm just proud to get behind her. I'd like you to open up your Bibles, please, to the book Bereshi to Genesis, the parasha, the reading that's worked through uh, here at King of Kings is Parasha Noach. In, in the Jewish world, the uh, Bible is broken down into, into segments, reading segments, so we can get through the Torah in the course of an entire year. That's the name of the game. Uh, the first Parasha is Bereshit, um, and it goes from Genesis 1-1, bleeding over into uh, the beginning of chapter six. The next is Noach, and here at King of Kings, we do it a week early, so I'll do Noach, but I'll go back to the, the, the beginning parasha. Next week uh, uh, is Lech Lecha, it's the story of Abraham. What I want to do is just say a prayer again with you and, and get the hearts and the mind focused, and then I want to tell you a story that is really bad, bad story. Bad story, sick story. I gotta make nice with the Genesis text when there's a world that's degenerating. So even, you know, I gotta pray just for my own self, not yours. Lord, please we come before you in Yeshua's name, Father, and as we open up your word, I pray, Father, that there's a word uh, for each and every one here, that it's not some eccentric professor showboating, that it's not, uh, um, just dazzling with a biblical translation, rather, Father, that it's your spirit uh, getting into hearts as we get into your heart, as we hear your word, Father. Pray you bless this in Yeshua's name. Amen. The reason why I say it's a bad story and mean it is because in addition to being an eccentric professor, I've had a career as a cop. 
worked as a detective. I've seen more than one crime scene. And when you look at the beginning of the Bible, you open it up, you can put yellow crime scene tape all over it. In, in, in Genesis 126, uh, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. That's what he says. Uh, the, the imago Dei, the image of God. Man was made good and placed in paradise. Paradise comes from a Latin word meaning enclosed garden. We know Gan Eden, Eden. Didn't give a lot of instructions. The, the people have a lot of liberty. You haven't read five minutes into the Bible till you realize, my God, something has gone horribly wrong here. It's a crime scene, it's a property crime. He says, don't take, this is mine. So she takes. You know, if the Lord wouldn't have said, don't take it, then she would have walked right by it. There are lots of trees around there, but there's something about, don't take it, oh, well, why not, you know? You know, the word lust comes from a word meaning the desire for the forbidden. Well, gee, I wonder what that is. Actually, the Lord didn't tell her don't take it. She wasn't even created then. <laughs> Let's not blame the ladies. Now, I'm lady friendly. I blew Stardust and Danya's face for the first 10 minutes, so I'm good to go. By the way, while you're on it, do you know that Tertullian, see, lady, you distracted me, but I'm following your lead. <laughs> Tertullian, a, 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 a church father from North Africa, wrote a book called On Women and Their Apparel, On the Apparel of Women. Let me see. Oh, ladies, you wouldn't like him. Oh, you wouldn't like Tertullian. You wouldn't like him. Because Tertullian said of women, he said that you are the devil's gateway. <laughs> See, according to Tertullian, and he, and he even says there in, in his introduction, he says that the devil was not valiant enough to attack man. So what he did is he attacked woman, and she attacked man. So Tertullian says, you are the devil's gateway. You are the unsealer of the forbidden fruit. Now, the reason why this is in his introduction to a book that's on the apparel of women. Now, ladies, you're really going to get mad. Can I duck behind this? Just remember, lady, he said it, I didn't. What he said was that any woman that wears anything but earth tones that is, ladies, listen to me, those pastels don't work. That's Eve working through you to be eye candy to attract the males of the species. The same spirit that's at work in Eve is at work in you. Here, I duck. I duck. I duck. That's Tertullian, not me. Now, where was I? Yes. The last I checked, when the boss said, don't eat the tree, Eve wasn't even created yet. She had no firsthand knowledge. What happens is her old man took a nap. That's what happened. He took a nap. He fell asleep. He woke up. He'd been working hard. He's entitled to a nap, you should know. He's been naming animals. Very busy man, you know, checking out the garden, looking at fruit and stuff. But he's been seeing a lot of things, but nothing really interested him personally, if you know what I mean. He sees these animals, they come in twos, but he's just in ones. He knows it. He's a very smart man. He can talk to snakes. They all very, very intelligent. He realizes there's a problem here. He takes a nap. He wakes up and he goes, now that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> he sees Eve. He's a very happy man. It was his job to pass along the information to Eve. She didn't know from nothing. You get to the third chapter. She's walking in the garden. All of a sudden, Hey, lady, it's, it's right there. <laughs> You're saying, Jeffrey, do you translate it? Psst. Hey, lady. Well, not really. I'm paraphrasing. I'll read in a moment. Yeah, we'll get to the reading already. The comedy act's not working. I'll get there, I promise. Psst. Hey, lady. We got a little conversation going. Before you know it, things have gone from bad to worse and worse yet. And as if that's not bad enough, you have the, the original sin. 
you have that. And then the Lord confronts and they're blaming. Hey, who did this? The, the man says, don't look at me. Talk to my woman. Now, that's not accepting responsibility, Adam. You know, you know, who did this? I don't know. Talk to her. Well, lady, what do you have to say? Talk to the snake. The snake slithers away. You know, no one's taking responsibility for nothing. If we could have taken some responsibility, maybe we could have fixed it. Who knows? Who knows? The word responsibility comes from two words, response and ability. See, that's why they call me doctor. I figure that out for you, the four-syllable <laughs> letters. People being responsible, taking ownership for their business. How about that? Adam and Eve, they don't want to know from nothing. So what happens is God shows them the door to the east. Zygazunt, you should go. Flaming sword. Now what happens is you read the Bible, the fourth chapter, it's, it's bad too. You know, I know brothers sometimes fight. I've raised two boys. Believe me, it's not always perfect. It's not always perfect. But, you know, for as much as the brother threatened to kill the brother in my family, they didn't do. For as much as I threatened to kill them, I didn't do. I threatened to kill them. I threatened to sell them into slavery. Everything possible. You read the original sin, what happens is that you talk about a dysfunctional family, so what happens is things get bad, Adam and Eve leave, they're out of the garden, and what happens? Fratricide. Brother kills brother, that's what happens. Now, I've heard of not getting along, I've heard of temper, but really, brother killing brother. You haven't read three minutes into the Bible. Three stinking minutes. And you realize we have trouble in River City. Well, it really was River City then. You look at Eden and all that, you know. I'll explain later, you know. Listen, to me it was trouble. They leave the garden and it goes from bad to worse. Now one brother kills another brother and you read on for a few minutes what's introduced into the narrative. Uh, polygamy. Last I checked, excuse me, a man should leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, not joined to his wives. Gee, what's that all about? What's that all about? And then we have this polygamy thing happening. Then we have a man boasting. He says, you know, someone insulted me, so I killed him. <laughs> now, listen to me. Uh, listen, I mean, I, I, I could be an eccentric theologian, but I could be a police officer. I want to get yellow tape and wrap it all around this book. It's not impressive reading to tell you the God's honest truth. I am not a happy camper. And if I'm not happy, just think how God felt. Amen. Now, with this thing going from bad to worse, now I can stop being the amateur, frustrated comedian that I never could be and start being a Bible teacher in Parasha Noach. I want you to turn with me, please, to chapter 6. Against the backdrop of a deteriorating world... We're told, these are the genealogies of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among his generation. Noah continually walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was ruined before God, and the earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and behold, it was ruined because all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. So I said, listen to me, it's not a good story. When you look at Genesis, listen, I, I should be here next week, not this week. I'm not inviting myself back, I gotta go home, but listen to me, you get to the 12th chapter, Abraham walked by faith, oh, we got solutions. We, we get to God's plan to fix it. Give me that. I can preach that, beat that drum. But this story here, we have to look how it's broken. I think personally, what makes the good news look so good is that the bad news can be really bad. And here, if you can imagine, according to the narrative, God made you mankind, and he is utterly disappointed. I don't know if you've ever looked at something and been utterly disappointed by what you saw. Um, you know, at my age in life, when I think of my life's work, you know, I'm, I'm not a particularly young man at 58, and uh, I want to be able to be proud of, of the life that I live and that I built something, that I accomplished something. You want to have a sense of satisfaction associated with it, but to think that 
uh, the good Lord put a good man on a good earth and, and with good opportunities and see what it came to. It's absolutely tragic. And in that quagmire, in that quagmire, in that cesspool, there, there is a man who's noted that he himself, if you look in verse 9, that he's a righteous man. He's a blameless man among his generation. And he continually walked with God. When I think of this story a little, I, I wonder the extent to which humans today might find some personal application. That is, in so many ways, we live in a world that's unimpressive, don't you think? I mean, I'm not altogether proud to see uh, my own culture. I mean, things that are basic, things that are obvious. Uh, You know, it says in the previous uh, uh, that sexual things had just gotten out of control. If you look in chapter 6, verse 1, now when human mankind began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, then the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were good and they took for themselves wives, any they chose. And Adonai said, my spirit will not remain with you mankind forever. I mean, you, you have this kind of out of control lust You have this acquisitiveness. And um, this isn't just a characteristic of the previous age. It seems, in so many ways, characteristic of the modern one. Um, We we, we see early on in in the text that that we see vitiation. That's that big word. I don't know if that's three or four syllables. I'm a little tired. But you throw around big words. Vitiation. Yeah, yeah, that's four. Just for you. And again, it creates the illusion, you know what you're talking about when you want to sound scholarly. Defilement. Oh, friends, there's uh, there's a world gone bad here. And sad to say, in so many ways, in so many days, it's so much like our own. And truth be known, we're affected by it. Because we live in it. But Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among his generation. Noah continually walked with God. What I want to do is is skip over that which uh, comes immediately. There's the story of uh, Noah's Ark, uh, the the, the boat that's built. You have, uh, and by the way, if you look at imagery amongst the first believers, um, you can... Go. I mean, I've been to, to Rome, Italy. I made television. For, we, we filmed there all over Israel as well. You can see in the catacombs, there's, there's pictures where these first followers of Yeshua leave images and, and pictures of Noah and the ark are found there. Uh, this is where you get the term coming into a fellowship. Um, there's old songs, you know, I was sinking deep in sin. You know, there's, there's songs of, it's not contemporary music, but it's image that people were drowning and, and people came to the Lord and they got involved in a fellowship. They got involved in the boat. You can look at first century uh, iconography. I've, I've, I've studied just the etchings that were left in places where early believers met in first century Israel. And there's various symbols there of boats and the anchor. Uh, There's various kinds of images that hark back to boating motifs. There's a sense in which we we jump into the boat. Uh, There's too much aloneness in in the culture today. Part of that is because uh, people have been disappointed by relationships. You know, you look at Adam and Eve, when they first saw each other, they had fantasy. After a while, they had history, and it wasn't nearly as impressive. Boy, me, woods girl, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you put some years behind it, and all of a sudden, then people can build up stuff. And you know, Adam and Eve have a history they don't resolve. And uh, uh, what happens is, is similarly, people can just get butchered in human relations. They marry for an ideal. They think they got a raw deal. They go searching for a new deal. And we're just in a culture that just uh, alienation is ubiquitous. And we feel rejected and we reject people by nature and people wind up alone. And it's very hard for us to think in terms of coming into a boat. 
But the truth of the matter is, is as when we close this evening and pray for the Spirit of God to answer those requests and help you be what you can be, none of us can be anything alone in God, truth be known. God can save you, but you're not going to get any, you're not gonna, he's not going to get any work out of you, not really. They're, they're true, at least not as compared to what would happen if you'd link up with others. They're, they're, there's a kind of strength. If you look at trees, the sequoia, some, I forget whether it's sequoia or redwood on the west coast of the United States, towering big trees. Uh, but what's interesting about those trees, and I was shocked to learn it, you would think if they're that high up, they have roots that go deep in the ground. No, they don't. It's not deep roots. They go down and they fan out and they get wrapped up with all kinds of other roots and other trees. And, 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 and it's that connectedness that, that, that gives a kind of stability that wouldn't otherwise be there. In any case, uh, uh, early followers of Yeshua picked up on this uh, Noah's Ark motif. Of course, the uh, New Covenant authors give voice to it as well. Um, but I want to skip over the, the Noah's Ark story just to alight upon uh, for time's sake as I need to be thinking about the conclusion. I want to look at uh, what happens when they get out of the boat because this is one of the reasons why I say it, it's hard to find a good story here. I want you to look in chapter 9. Um, I'm interested in chapter 9, verse 18. We're told, Noah's son who came out from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. It's interesting that that's inserted right away because Canaan is going to be known for its debauchery in a few moments as you read on through the narrative. It's like the, the seeds of all things sinful. Noah's son who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. Moses is minded to insert in the narrative. These three were Noah's son, and from these the whole earth dispersed. Then Noah, a man of the soil, was first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, got drunk, and was uncovered in his tent. So here you have Noah, you know, what's salvageable in humanity. The best kitty in the human litter, God says, look, we'll save you and the boys and the girls. Come on, build a boat. It's construed to the best of the best. What happens is, after all of this recedes, according to the narrative, um, you know, they get out of the boat, and, and you find him nipping on the berries. He's drunk. <laughs> Not just a little, you know, holiday Manischewitz, you know, four <laughs> cups for Passover. He's, there's no Passover. He's nipping on the berries. And, and he's probably romping around the tent with Mrs. Noah. I say no more. <laughs> you say, Jeffrey, that's inappropriate. It's right. And you take it up with the author. <laughs> you take it up. The complaint department is in heaven. I, I'm, I only work here. Blame Donya. I'm just reading the thing. Tell you the thing. Give her all the credit. Give her all the blame. What happens? He drank some of the wine and was uncovered in his tent. Then Ham, Canaan's father, again, we're reminded, Canaan's father, you know, Canaanites are going to come later, saw his father's private parts and told his two brothers outside. Well, you're saying, Jeffrey, now it's a little weird you're even talking about this stuff, but don't worry, listen, we're over shortly. I see the clock. You shouldn't worry. You have a little fetish thing here? No, it's, I, I just figure, look, you know, I'm telling the story of Noah, and there it is. It's there. It's there. When you look around the text, the issue of seeing his father's nakedness, um, why would the fact that a, a boy saw his father's nakedness invoke this kind of ire? When this can happen in households, when people live together and you go into locker rooms and what have you, the males of the species aren't as, I won't say anymore, I'm moving right along here. But the point is, is what are we looking at here when we're talking about he saw his father's nakedness? Arguably an archaic expression for his wife. That is, uh, the, and the reason why I mention that, if you look in Leviticus uh, um, chapter 20, verse 11, and just dig around there, you'll see 
um, the expression nakedness uh, in reference to the wife. You know, if you look at uh, Adam and Cheva, the two become one flesh. And what's issued here, arguably, is that Noah's nipping on the berries, he's a little drunk, and you have a son who's disrespectful, who's voyeuristic with his father who's acting the fool because of the wine. So you see that even though there's a problem with sin and, and God says, listen, uh, enough already, this isn't good. What, so we destroy the world with a flood, but this is, these are the best kitties in the litter. And what happens is the problem follows. And, and, and if this is the royal family, Noah playing the fool, a, 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 a disrespectful son, who then will go tell the others, hey, look what dad's doing, and the other boys, uh, they're, they're minded to be respectful, and uh, I mean, first of all, anybody that's gonna disrespect their own father, this is very egregious in the Bible. That's why if you look at the commandments, you have the commandments to love God, you know, to not to make any idols, don't take his name in vain, keep the Sabbath, you have that stuff. And then the first of the human commands are honor your father and mother. If someone can't marshal the energies to be respectful to their own father or mother, it's a death sentence on them. They're going to be worthless in life. Imperfect as parents are, if someone can't marshal the energies to be respectful to a parent, they're not going to be respectful to a teacher, they're not going to be respectful to a cop, they're not going to be respectful to an employer, they're not going to be respectful to a spouse. You know, that's why, you know, uh, if a girl is dating some guy, she wants to see what he's really like, oh, he's really cool. Well, cool, I'm glad to hear that. You know, when you go to his house, see how he treats his mother, because the way he treats his mother is the way he's going to be toward you if you go down the line with him. Now, I just mentioned this. When I look at the Bible, it is absolutely disgusting right here. It, it, it is absolutely disgusting. When I read the text, the tree of life, When I look at the opening of Genesis, I am not a happy camper. I think God is telling us that there's real problems in humanity. Well, he does tell us that, but he doesn't just tell us that. But the resolution for the problem is as it unfolds as we read on through the story. Let me go forward in the story, then give an application to you, and then close, hand it over to Wayne to close the service as he'd like. Uh, um, when I read the text, I read that God has made man upright, but people really have, have messed up. Uh, it's not just that a human being can have a problem, but there's something problematic in the human condition according to the text. And this seems evidence to me um, when I look at the, the stories that the biblical author serves up, that if this is a theological telling of history, this is Moses' way of saying all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so that's why when I read this story, it's hard to preach it because I can see aspects of my own in it. You know, just to be, you know, gut level honest, God awful truth, you know. I mean, the truth is, is I share the human condition. I'm not, you can put reverend or doctor or rabbi or professor in someone's name, in front of someone's name, uh, but we still bear the stamp of humanity. Now, when you come here next week or when you read on in the Bible for weeks to come, you're going you're gonna to read, uh, you know, God's recipe to fix this thing. He's a pharmacist, you know, takes, takes these, you know, he is. You know, God told Moses, tell the Jews, to, you know, he comes down Mount Sinai, says, listen, just take these tablets, you'll be fine in the morning. <laughs> it's the way we do, we dispense. We dispense. Just take them, believe me, we can fix things. We can fix this thing. I mean, when, when, when you read on through the story, it gets very cool. It really does. There's the story here about God, just uh, the, all of you mankind is, is jaded, but, but he calls a man Avraham, Abraham, and he calls him to a land, this land where you are now. He calls him here, and he says, I'm going to do something through you to bring redemption to you mankind. And when you open up the new covenant, whether you read it in the tree of life version or not in the Hebrew, 
Sefer Toldot, HaYeshua HaMashiach Ben David Ben Avraham, the book of the, the genealogies of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, going right back. Uh, when you read the text, God really does have a fix-it. Now, I haven't accentuated the fix-it side of it. I've just talked about the problem. As the worship team comes this evening, I do want to uh, raise the question. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard on the one hand, uh, but just personally, uh, within the sound of my voice, is there someone that just, it makes you want to pray for someone maybe for yourself. When you look at the biblical text, when you think of the ravages of humanity, my question is, is there someone that would want to today say, uh, Lord, I want to step outside of this downward spiraling cycle. I'm not going to ask you to come up. I could and wouldn't be ashamed to do that because you look in the text and we're told that Noah walked with God. And so that asking people to stand up and come forward to make the decision is, uh, um, it has precedent in the biblical text. But especially for those that are traveling, you know, I want you to to go home and and I want you to find a local congregation and I want you to take that step there because it's, it's deciding to walk with God. It's not just to walk alone. You have to make a decision alone, but you're deciding You want to walk with imperfect others and participate. You want to get in the boat. You don't want to live in the swamp. Uh, You you, you don't want the wreckages of ruined lives just to sweep up to your shores all the time. You want to break that cycle in your life, and you want to participate in breaking that cycle in others. I'll tell you what I really do want to call forth in prayer this morning, uh, this evening, excuse me, and I know that there's something in particular that, that Wayne wants to pray about, and I'll let him talk to you about that in a moment. I'm wondering if there's any other Donnie Greenbergs in the room. You know, a good way to escape the human condition is to find out what God is saying in you. You know, you're reading the Bible. The Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters and brought new life form out of chaos and darkness and void. That's what the Bible says. And I'm wondering if the God that did it then is in the business of doing it now. You know, if being born hasn't been all that it's cracked up to be, what about being born again? Try that. You get a second chance. And, 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 And with... You know, we're told Adam received God's spirit. Lord breathed on him and he became a a, a life, a living being. Gee, come on, guys. I wonder, um, how could Donya Greenberg just just hear from God and now there's this? Something the world hasn't seen in 2,000 years. Didn't have two nickels to rub together to make it happen. People got on board. There's Dr. Malin there. There's Dr. Gannon. There's probably others here too that participated in this. How does that happen? Why would anybody follow her? She hasn't earned the right to lead in a project like this, humanly speaking. Who does she think she is? Well, I'll tell you what she is. She's a woman that let what was in here start to come out into the world. She was a person that decided to walk by faith, to roll the dice against an uncertain future, see where it all led. Let me tell you from Jerusalem, a lot of people pay lip service to that, but they never do it. Roll the dice, take the leap, see what happens. Maybe there's something in you. What was in Danya was more than she could pull off didn't have the money, didn't have the skill, but she had the dream. And what happens is, is the resource gets behind the dream. It's a miracle. The Lord sends, sends the Ray Gannons of the world. So now, five years later, I can 
stand up and say kudos to you, Danya and Mark and the family who labored indefatigably. Kudos to you, uh, board of directors. Kudos to you, 70-some individuals. Dan Juster reminded me the other night that 70, hmm, that's the Septuagint. I should have thought of that, but I was too jet-lagged at the time. But I'm just wondering if the same God that can, you know, get a hold of a Jeffrey Seif, miracle that that's all about, that can kind of get a hold of a Donnie Greenberg, I wonder what's cooking in you. I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know you. In fact, I'm so tired with jet lag, I don't know much. All that I know is that clock is saying, it's time to end, Jeffrey. And I'm okay with that. But here in Jerusalem, it wouldn't be great if uh, when Wayne comes, and I know he wants to pray about something anyways, and I know what he wants to pray about, and I'm glad about it. But wouldn't it be great if here in Jerusalem, you just gave over to the Lord afresh what's been cooking in you and what you buried? Wouldn't that be a cool thing to do? And who knows? This is what Danya's dream evolved into five years later. Who knows where you can go? Amen to that, Wayne.